Welcome to Books of Our Time, brought to you by the Massachusetts School of Law and C Nationwide. Today we shall discuss a biography of one of the greatest hitters who ever lived, Theodore Samuel Williams, Ted Williams, of the Boston Red Sox. Despite having missed nearly five years of his prime hitting years because he was a Marine fighter pilot in World War II in Korea, Williams' lifetime batting average was 344 and his total number of home runs was 521. The book's author, Ben Bradley Jr., is a reporter and editor with the Boston Globe and is with me today to discuss his book. And I am Lawrence R. Velvel, the Dean of the Massachusetts School of Law. Well, thank you very much for being with us and this being Boston, <laughs> I'm sure this will be well received. <laughs> uh, tell me, uh, what caused you uh, to decide to write a biography of Ted Williams? Well, Williams was a, a childhood hero of mine, and I remember as a kid, uh, my bedroom wall was uh, plastered with pictures of uh, Ted Williams cut out from Sports Illustrated or Sport Magazine. Um, I grew up in Cambridge, Mass, and uh, I'm old enough that I saw him play the last two or three years of his career, so I would go down to Fenway Park as often as I could, and um, it was special watching that guy hit. Um, when he came to bat, uh, everyone was at the, on the edge of their seat. No one would have dreamed of leaving their seats to go get a hot dog or anything like that. <laughs> there was an electricity in the air. I remember a fellow, uh, a reporter of the day, told me that he once interviewed a blind man and um, asked him why he came to the park when he could be home watching the, listening to the game on the radio. He said, I like the sounds of the park when Ted Williams comes to bat. And I think that's a nice uh, little vignette. It was a murmur or a buzz yes, or something yeah, like that? Yeah. I think that illustrates the, the impact that he had. And, and often um, when he had his last at bat, when it, or it appeared so, people would leave the park. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he, you never knew what, what Williams was going to do. He, ha he had this uh, volatile, almost volcanic personality, and you never knew when he might pop off or, or do something uh, dramatic. People were aware of that and um, just on the edge of their seats. You say he was a mechanic personality. I take it that he got, uh, he got away with that because he was Ted Williams. I, I can't imagine almost anybody else, except maybe DiMaggio had he been that way, which he was not, uh, getting away with something like that. Well, he didn't always get away with it. Uh, you know, in the mid-50s, there were several incidents where he spat at the crowd, spat at the press box, uh, you know, gave the finger to the crowd, you know. he. <laughs> He, he, had, he was very thin-skinned, Ted. Uh -huh. uh, he, he couldn't accept criticism. Um, he reasoned that he was the best at what he did. He was trying hard. That criticism of him, particularly from the writers, was ill-informed. Uh, so he would pop off. But, you know, that, yeah, that, that behavior, if you contrast it, especially uh, to the players of today, is so unusual. You know, the, the players today, uh, are trained just to um, accept any boos or abuse they get from the crowd as, a, you know, that's the fans' price of admission and they're entitled to, uh, to boo if they want to. But uh, Ted didn't, uh, didn't buy that that way and he, he, um, he would react and then fans would see that and uh, uh, be encouraged to get under his skin even more because they could see they were yeah. getting a reaction. It was like, yeah. you know, poking a, a bear from behind the safety of the uh, <laughs> bars at the yeah. zoo, you know. Yeah, yeah. I think it was Hugh Hellman who said he's got everything except the ability to take advice. Yeah. I think that was in regard to uh, refusing to go to left field when the shift was implemented. Lou Boudreau, uh, 46 when he was with the Indians, swung all the players over to the right side of the baseball field in what was then a very innovative defensive scheme. And uh, Ted said, what the hell is this to the umpire? Is this legal? 
And uh, the umpire says, yes, Ted, it is. Get back on the box and hit. And, um, but it was a very effective maneuver. And uh, Ted was stubborn, and he reasoned that he was a power hitter, and the fans were coming to uh, watch him hit, not to bunt or to uh, hit a little dinky single down the left field line. So he's pretty stubborn that way. And uh, he continued basically to try and pull the ball. But he reasoned, he, he, he concluded that over his lifetime, uh, that shift cost him about 15 points off his lifetime batting average. So if he ended 354, yeah. he thought he would have been up around 359. Didn't he ultimately start hitting to left to overcome the shift, or did he never do so? Well, he, he, he tried a little bit, but he um, wasn't very successful at it. And um, that's when some of the other hitters like Ty Cobb and, and uh, some others were critical of him uh, for not doing it more effectively. But, but basically, he decided to just keep pounding the ball to right field to pull the ball. Yeah. Do you think that, uh, as Yogi Berra said, that Williams was not only one of the greatest hitters ever, which he wanted to be, but the greatest hitter ever, which I don't, th I don't know that he ever entertained that thought. Maybe he did. Oh, he did entertain that thought. Did he? That, that was his lifetime uh, ambition. You know, he famously said that when he retired, he wanted people when they saw him, uh, encountered him on the street, uh, to say, there goes the greatest hitter who ever lived. That was his ambition, and I would argue that he achieved that. Uh, he, was, uh, he was a fantastic hitter who still holds the all-time record for on-base percentage, yeah. 482, yeah. meaning that he reached base almost one out of, out of every two times. Uh, that includes walks? Includes walks, yes. Yeah doesn't matter but because <laughs> well these days that there's more and more of a uh, an emphasis on that stat uh, he, he was criticized by some for walking too much but uh, today they um, there's much more of an emphasis on uh, walk is as good as a hit right. getting on base you know there's a premium on that yeah. so he was ahead of his time I think D didn't he feel that if he started swinging at a ball an inch off the plate pretty soon the pitchers would pitch it two inches off the exactly, plate. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> a slippery slope. Slippery slope, yeah. And uh, there, was a, there was a lively debate about that back in the day. Uh, Joe DiMaggio, for instance, was critical of Williams for, for adopting that philosophy on the theory that, you know, he, he was the best hitter on the team and if there's a, a runner in scoring position and you take a walk, you're hurting your team by not having your best hitter try to knock the guy in. But Williams argued, uh, the, he made that slippery slope argument that if you chase a ball one inch, as you said, soon the pitcher will throw it two inches off and then the advantage swings to him. They had a lot of good hitters on that team, didn't they? I mean, I seem to remember Tropo and uh, Bobby Doerr, Tom DiMaggio. Yeah. Vern Junior Stevens. Junior these, Stevens. These are the teams of the uh, late 40s. And, uh, yeah. Uh, Bertie Tebbets was a pretty good hitter. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Those are great teams, and the amazing thing was that they <coughs> didn't win more pennants and more World Series. Somehow or other, the Yankees, gosh darn their eyes, <laughs> always seemed to beat them, <laughs> oh, to finish ahead of them. Well, they had better pitching and, and really better lineups. The Yankees had a far better supporting cast than, yeah. than the Red Sox did for Ted. Yeah, yeah. Isn't it rather remarkable that, that Williams, was it at ages 39 and 40, he won the uh, hitting championship uh, two years in a row at that age? Has anybody else ever come close to winning it at that I age? I don't believe so. 57 or 8, yeah. he, he hit uh, 57. He hit 388, yeah. which was a, an astonishing achievement for a guy 39 years old. And well, it's an astonishing achievement for anybody, at least today it would yeah. be. Yeah, well, and he, he, he thought that was his uh, greatest achievement, actually better than the year he hit 406. He was just three or four, uh, what he called leg hits, meaning those that right. you have to beat out. He was slow, you know, he couldn't really run. Right. Uh, but if he'd had uh, five or six more leg hits even, he would have hit 400 at that age which would have, would have been really incredible.
Didn't he once say, he was watching Mickey Mantle, said, if I could run like that, I'd hit 400 every year? Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, he envied uh, Mantle his speed. Yeah, he did not think he'd be the last 400 hitter, but he is. Mm. Somebody hit 388, George, George, George Brett. What accounts for the fact, in your opinion, that nobody's hit 400 since Williams? First, you have to uh, look at it positively for Williams, that he was this singular talent. Um, but also the game has changed since his time, and a uh, much more of an emphasis on relief pitching than there was in Ted's day. In his day, you know, it was common, much more common, for a, a starting pitcher to go nine innings and finish the game. Favorite pitcher of all times would be, of course, uh, Pedro Martinez. However, favorite closer would be Mariano Rivera. The one I liked the most would be Pedro Martinez. I guess uh, Pedro, <laughs> he, he had such a tremendous changeup that I swear when I used to watch him pitch, he, he, could tell the, the, he could tell the hitter what's coming and the hitter would still miss it. Allison was a legal assistant with much bigger dreams. Eric turned his business background into so much more. They found their futures at the Massachusetts School of Law, and so can you. Immerse yourself in a fun, supportive campus environment. Learn professional skills from instructors with real-world experience. Take the first step in changing your life at the most affordable law school in New England, the Massachusetts School of Law at Andover. Your future starts here. Growing up, uh, my favorite hitter to watch was uh, Mo Vaughn. I love watching Mo Vaughn uh, either on TV or at the ballpark. And I just remember the way he kind of stood in the aftermath of a big mammoth home run. It looked like he had just, you know, pulled a, uh, a plug out of the ocean. Just stayed up like that. And uh, the balls were towering home runs. And uh, prior to David Ortiz, I'd, I'd never seen anybody launch home runs out of Fenway with such regularity, so uh, I loved watching Mo Vaughn hit as a kid. I think the greatest hitter of all time was Ted Williams. He had his career cut short by the military at a time when he was in his prime, and he still dominated the game both before and after. Very few people in the history of baseball could hit it like he could. Maybe Ruth. Ruth could, I think. I guess uh, overall you'd have to say Ruth was you know, a smidgen better hitter. But uh, that's, that's, <laughs> so what? <laughs> you know, Williams was pretty great. Maybe for power, but, but for power and average, yeah. I think Williams is uh, tops. Why did you start the book with a description uh, of the uh, procedure at Alcor after he passed away and they severed his head? Williams, when he died, his son, uh, John Henry decided to have Ted's remains uh, frozen in a procedure that is known as uh, cryonics. This is a, a, a belief, really, by uh, a relatively small number of people in the country, maybe several thousand, who hope that medicine and uh, medical science will have advanced to the point that someday people will be able to cure you of whatever it is you've died from and then a big leap, bring you back to life. Uh, a lot of holes in this theory, and they haven't worked out how it will, will, will happen. But uh, the son was a believer in this, and uh, this caused enormous controversy um, after Ted died. Uh, a lot of people thought this was cruel and barbaric, and that Ted himself didn't want it. And uh, I wanted, one of the things that I set out to do was to try and investigate uh, whether Williams really did want this. And um, so I was able to find out a lot about what happened on that day. I opened the book there because it was really people's last memory of what happened to Ted. And I got a lot of new material which disclosed in the book exactly what did happen. And so I decided that that would be uh, an interesting and a different way to start the book rather than in the conventional uh, biographical way that he was born on August 30th, uh, 1918 in San Diego. I get to that. 
What were some of the new things that you discovered? My conclusion was that Ted, uh, while he may have agreed to John Henry's request to um, have his remains cryonically preserved, that if he did, he wasn't of sound mind at the time. And he told others um, after he supposedly agreed to this in November of 2000 that no, he wanted to have his remains uh, cremated the way uh, his will specified. Um, so that was a, a key finding. But I also talked to people who were in the operating room when um, his body arrived and um, we got the first detail of what happened inside that operating room, how they uh, went about preparing his, his body and, and some rather gruesome stuff, uh, cutting off his head, and, and it was shocking, really, and I thought people should know that. Yeah, it is shocking. Yeah. I got this sense that, his, that he had a drive for perfection, which is really the key to everything that he did. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, where did he get that, and how, how did he, where did he get it, and how did he use it in his baseball career? He, he was a perfectionist, it's true. He was blessed with great natural talent, like extraordinary eyesight, you know, a, a beautiful swing. And, um, but he, he resented it when people tried to attribute his success to simply those natural gifts. He said, no one outworked me. No one swung a bat more often than me. No one lived to hit the way um, I did. And uh, he wanted to be the best at what he did. People who um, are at the top of their field, whatever that field may be, do have uh, a drive for perfection. I don't think that the, the drive itself is, is that unique, but it requires a lot of discipline, and he had that. I think that came, at, le at least the, the uh, discipline part, uh, came from his mother, um, who was uh, a very interesting figure, which, who I go into a lot in the book, and perhaps we, we can uh, discuss that. Um, she was a, a Salvation Army worker in, uh, in San Diego during the Depression, and she was a colorful figure known as uh, Salvation May, and she was devoted to her work uh, the way Ted was devoted to baseball. And I think he did derive some of his drive and discipline from the way he saw his mother uh, behave. And she was so zealous about what she did that she would be out until all hours of the night on the streets of San Diego saving souls and not be home to take care of uh, young Teddy Ballgame and his brother, uh, younger brother Danny, until 10, 11 o'clock at night. Father was an alcoholic and largely absent, so not as big of a factor in uh, Ted's life as the mother. But Ted and his brother Danny grew up some of the first latchkey kids. They'd be on the porch, on the front porch of the house, 10, 11 o'clock at night, waiting for mom to come home and uh, cook them a meal. Luckily for Williams, there was a playground down the, down the street with lights so he could play ball at night. So baseball became his salvation. That was University Field or University yes. Park in San Diego? Yes, yes, also known as North Park. So he practiced and practiced and practiced to build on his uh, natural talent. And um, so I think he did become the greatest hitter who ever lived. Yeah, you think he was better than Ruth? I think combining power and, and average, I, I think w Ruth would, would have him on power, certainly, just raw power, but um, Ted uh, hit better for average. I have a daughter living in San Diego, and the only time in my life I have ever gone by a place just to see where so-and-so you know, grew up or did this or did that <laughs> was there. <laughs> you know, I said, I gotta go by there. That's what Ted Williams learned to yeah. hit. When we played ball as a kid. Yeah. I've got to go by there. <laughs> yeah, well, that's interesting because I I, uh, I was out, I went back out there on a visit recently with my son, and he wanted to go there, and I showed <laughs> it to him too. Those days, I guess there was a lot more prejudice in the country. Oh, so he 
hid his background, which was ha half, half Mexican American, wasn't right. it? Well, th this was one of the more interesting parts of the, uh, of the Williams story to me. Uh, his mother was Mexican, born there, raised there, came to um, San Diego, um, you know, when she was a uh, young woman or to, to middle age. And um, so that made Ted Mexican-American. His father was American, Anglo. But this was a fact that he chose to conceal throughout his life. He was worried that prejudice of the day could hurt his career. And there was more evidence that uh, in Major League Baseball that there was uh, more prejudice against the black players of the day. Uh, but Williams wasn't going to take any chances. Yeah. So he didn't talk about that until um, late in life. And uh, well, Of course, he looked Anglo. He looked Anglo. He had his father's genes, and so no one really knew. Um, but I was interested in tracking down his relatives on the Mexican side of the family. And the, one of the first things I did was I reached a first cousin who lived up in uh, the Santa Barbara area. And uh, she said, come on up, and I'll convene a family meeting for you. Hmm. And uh, That's the Venzors? The Venzors. And so I walked in that room, and I was struck by how dark uh, they were, darkly complected compared to, to Ted, who, who really did have his father's uh, genes. And while they were very proud, this group, of their famous cousin Ted, they also resented him a bit because he shunned them, basically, his entire life. And they told a, a fascinating story to illustrate that, um, of what happened in 1939 at the end of his rookie year when he had taken the American League by storm and uh, returned to San Diego, uh, the conquering hero, and about a hundred of the Mexican side of the family turned out to greet him at the train station. Ted gets off the train, takes one look at, the, at this gaggle of uh, Mexicans hightails it in the other direction. Want yeah. to have nothing to do with them. Yeah. And uh, that sticks in their craw to this day. I guess he had some problems with his uh, own family, his daughter. Well, he had two daughters. You're referring to Bobby Joe, the, yes. the oldest daughter? Yeah. yeah. He had two, Bobby Joe and Claudia, right? Yeah. Bobby Joe was the daughter by his first marriage. He was married three times. So uh, he hit 333. <laughs> <laughs> He had no children by the second, and then two uh, kids, a son, John Henry, and Claudia by his third marriage. And uh, he was not a good parent, Ted, by his own admission. Uh, towards the end of his life, reflecting, uh, he said, as a, as, a, um, as a husband and a father, I struck out, quote, unquote. And uh, he was largely preoccupied uh, with himself, self-absorbed. He tended to his career uh, almost exclusively at the expense of his personal life. His record as a husband and a father bore that out. I don't mean this cynically or sarcastically, but it's a statement of fact, I think. Self-absorption is something that you can get away with when you're the very best at what you do. Mm -hmm. And if you're not too good at what you do, self-absorption is not regarded well by the world around you. <laughs> I think I'd agree with that. Yeah. You can yeah. get away with a lot if you're the greatest hitter. Or whoever yeah, well, that's right. That's yeah. right. You point out that he was an intellectually curious guy, and one of the things he was curious about was the art of hitting, hitting a baseball. And that's probably an unusual thing. A lot of uh, baseball players, I think, uh, take a simplistic view of hitting, you know, see the ball, hit, the hit ball. it. That's it. Ted was interested in, in, uh, in the physics of baseball. And, um, you know, he once went to, uh, went over to MIT and paid a visit to a uh, physicist over there to talk about, you know, aerodynamics and what made a baseball curve and uh, Bernoulli's principle. And he was way ahead of his time in using a lighter bat. Uh, Louisville slugger people uh, told me that when he first 
proposed using a lighter bat, they said, Ted, you're crazy, you're a slugger, you know, we use a heavy bat. And he said, no, a lighter bat will increase my bat speed and therefore increase the torque and uh, that will produce as much power and uh, give me a quicker bat. So he was always interested in what made a better hitter and he always studied the pitchers very carefully and uh, kept a close uh, record of what, you know, who threw what to him, when, and what situation. And he'd always be cute quizzing his teammates about what a pitcher threw to them in a certain situation. And he would always get very upset and frustrated with his teammates if they came back and couldn't remember. You know, the average player often like just Dominic doesn't. DiMaggio. Yes. Yeah. Don't be a dummy, Doc. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He was a very angry guy in a lot of ways. Yes, he, he was. And kind of played hard with his relationships with people. Yes, the, the book deals a lot with uh, his anger. I think the anger was rooted in resentment of his mother for not being there for him as a child. You know, there's no hard proof of that, of course, but that's sort of my armchair psychologist's take. The anger became a double-edged sword for him. He used it to his advantage on the baseball field because he always said he hit better mad. So he would, you know, manufacture a, some kind of feud with the sports writers to get an edge going and to get himself revved up. And then why, why do you think he uh, hit better when he was angry? Because he was up. He was pumped up. Pumped up. And, uh, you know, it, it, it helped him as a motivator. Okay. He'd get himself worked up and, and uh, you know, create a, a narrative that for example, that he was getting bad press. He actually got a good press, but there was, he had a few columnists of the day who were antagonists, and he'd convince himself that, uh, you know, the world was out to get him, and, and, uh, <laughs> and so he'd go off on a tear and hit 500 for a month or something. But in his personal life, this anger would, would bubble up at uh, inappropriate times and places and caused him great difficulty in his personal life. As I understand it, he turned down an honorary degree from Harvard, which is passingly, vanishingly rare, I think would be the... Uh, hardly the, ever been done. Hardly, yeah, hardly Except ever. Catherine Hepburn and a few others, I think. I love that story. It, and it shows how insecure he was uh, intellectually. He was very curious, had a curious mind, a good mind but he, he was embarrassed at his lack of formal education, nothing more than a high school degree, and uh, always insisted, therefore, that his uh, children go to college, and uh, was disappointed in his uh, oldest daughter, Bobby Jo, who never did. I love the story that in 1991, Harvard uh, approached him on the 50th anniversary of his greatest achievement, hitting 406 in 1941 and wanted to give him an honorary degree. And I was talking with the, the dean uh, who was dealing with Williams then and uh, it was just very, very interesting. The guy said that, that Ted just said he would feel out of place among the intelligentsia in Harvard Yard <laughs> with his high school education. And uh, so he turned it down. It's a remarkable uh Self-abnegation, would that be the, a phrase that you could use for it? Yeah. In, in any event, he, he, apparently he worked very hard to build up his arms and wrists and hands. And uh, he used to do a lot of push-ups. Yeah, fingertip push-ups. Fingertip push-ups. He would lift a, um, he would get down on the floor and take a heavy chair, like the ones we're sitting in, and lift it up by one leg, up and down. He was skinny, very skinny as a kid and was always trying to uh, bulk up. He was, you know, almost 6'4", but, but uh, 160 pounds ringing wet. And um, so he was always trying to bulk up and do these, these uh, exercises. You know, the, in those days there was no weightlifting. Yes, right, right. Weightlifting must have come in, I think, in the I think I seem to remember it beginning in the late fifties or something when I was in college, yeah. and then it became a big big deal after that. I, I can remember going down to the gym uh, in Waterman Gymnasium uh, in Ann Arbor and just 
there were guys who were there every day uh, pumping iron. Yeah. <laughs> Like his mother, he had a monomaniacal focus, right? I mean, when he when he zeroed in on something, he focused on it. I don't want to say to the exclusion of everything else, but he focused on it very hard. He was single-minded, uh, very determined in in his uh, de desire to to become the greatest hitter who ever lived. He would take balls home with him from from uh, the minor from the Padres or something like that, and the uh, the manager didn't believe him when he said he would be hitting it, but he, and then went out to see what, and he was out there hitting the balls to the kids. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he, he, this was when he uh, signed his first pro contract with the San Diego Padres of the Pacific Coast League, and he was um, 18, 19 maybe, uh, right, just right out of high school, wasn't starting all the games initially, so he wanted extra batting practice. So he said to the manager, uh, I need some extra baseballs. I'm going to go back to the playground where I grew up, and he'd hi and he'd uh, hire some uh, kids to go shag balls for him, you know, for a nickel or whatever, back, whatever they paid back then. And yeah, the manager doubted what he was doing with all these baseballs. One day, just uh, went over to the park to see if he in fact was out there, and there he was, you know, slugging those balls. Apparently. Wiggins was in a way, in a, in a major way, one of these persons who combined great physical talent with a real head. And uh, apparently he had a tremendous memory, we talk about, uh, as to what pitchers had thrown him previously. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, that had to have helped because he figured out, what did he say once? I don't guess. Uh, I know what they're going to throw. It was something on that order. Yeah, but it was based on his uh, recollection of what the pitcher had thrown to him in the past in, in similar situations. And um, uh, pitchers who he would encounter um, in retirement, you know, they'd talk over old times, and the pitchers would be, you know, they'd get to telling war stories about uh, how, you know, Ted hit a home run off such and such a guy in 1948 and uh, and uh, the pitcher would say yeah I remember that day and Ted would say I remember it better, better than you it was a fastball low and away you know <laughs> he could just pick it out like that <laughs> I guess that when he was uh, young and coming up in the minor leagues he was considered quite the screwball he was, yeah. Screwball is the is the the term uh, that they used back in those days. Uh, today, I'm not That's sure. When I used it. <laughs> I'm not sure what it would be today, flake or something. But uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he he uh, he was very different. And uh, but you know, part of it was that he he had never uh, been anywhere. He'd never been out of San Diego. And uh, Bobby Doerr, for instance, was was. Uh, he was one of my first interviews. He's still alive, by the way, like 95 or something, out at, living out in uh, Oregon. He was great recalling Ted's first uh, road trip for the San Diego Padres when, you know, they would take the train up north and go all the way up into uh, uh, Oregon. And, uh, uh, and, you know, he'd never been on a train before. He'd never been in a restaurant, much less a club car, a dining car. Didn't know how to order a meal. You know, he'd, he'd, he'd come in and uh, he'd see his teammates already eating and, you know, he, he'd just go wild at all this food around and, and he'd, you know, uh, swipe a roll off some guy's plate and, you know, he didn't know how to, how to handle himself. And uh, Dora would take him under his wing and say, all right, you've got about $5 a day and meal money, and you've got a tip so-and-so, um, waitresses this much. And, uh, you know, he, he schooled Ted on the social graces. You don't hear about things like that anymore. I mean, do they not exist, or is it just that with television and so much newspapering and, and so on that, you know, everybody, there's nobody who's that basically unaware of things anymore that that I'm aware of yeah he was almost a feral child you know he, he, he didn't have he was kind of wild and uh, and uh, you know not not well off at all it was a yeah. very poor family yeah. 
Yeah. And so he was getting exposed to all these things yeah. for the first time. Yeah. Talk a little bit about his war against the writers. Why and, and who? And I have a long chapter in the book um, called The Writers. And it, it was the writers back then. It was newspapers. Yeah. You know, there was no television. Radio was, was uh, around. But newspapers dominated the scene. Ted didn't like uh, reporters, you know. He thought they were uh, prying into his personal life. He was very naive about the press. He, he, he didn't understand or appreciate that um, fans wanted to know something about his personal life. So even the most innocuous feature story that somebody might write um, about his childhood and growing up in San Diego, you know, the reporter would call up his mother for a, you know, just the most uh, innocuous quote about what young Ted was like. And Ted would uh, call the writer on the carpet and say, you know, you have no business uh, calling my mother like that. And he says, you can write about what I do on the field, but don't get into my personal life. You know, I mean, imagine in the tabloid press of, of today, somebody taking that, that position. He was just very naive, didn't understand how the press uh, worked. And generally, he got a, a very positive press. But there were a few columnists of the day, notably uh, one Dave Egan, who was um, uh, the star sports columnist for the old uh, Boston Record, uh, who uh, made it his mission to uh, give Ted the jab all the time. He would refer to him as uh, T. Williams Esquire. <laughs> and uh, Egan's, de Egan's mission was to basically take down whoever was up in, in, uh, in town. And Williams owned the city then, just owned it. Uh, and baseball was by far the dominant sport of uh, that era. You know, this was pre-NFL, pre-NBA. Uh, it was baseball that really was America's pastime. Well, I think that when I started reading the newspapers in 1947, still pretty much all baseball as I remember it. Yep, yep. yep. Uh, I think maybe not until the late 50s when you began to get a lot of football in the, in the 60s basketball and, you know, things, whatever. There was one year, I think it was in 1941, that he, uh, that, uh, he uh, going into the last day, his average was like 39999, which I think comes out to uh, 90, 199, 10 thousandths or something like that. I, I figured it out. In other words, four, 400 by any, by any uh, reasonable measure, but he wouldn't take that. He decided yeah. to go into the uh, yeah. last day and he hit probably the most dramatic day of his career and, and his signature uh, achievement. He's the last player in more than 70 years to hit 400. And um, he went into the last day of the season in 1941, um, hitting 399.5, I think it was. And his average would have been rounded up but he knew that would have come with a big asterisk. And, uh, and while his manager, Joe Cronin, said, um, uh, offered to let him sit out the last game, and in fact urged him to, Ted said, no way. Uh, if I'm gonna hit 400, it's gonna be legit, and I'm gonna play in the last day of the, of the year. And so it was a double header. And uh, what did he do? He played not just one game, but both games, and went six for eight on the day. So that was a courageous uh, decision and uh, really his signature moment. Did he ever talk about that? Oh, he talked about it a lot, yeah. yeah. And, and, and why did he say he did? He didn't want to be a cheese champion, so yeah, to Exactly, speak? exactly, yeah. He, didn't, he knew if, that he'd, if he sat it out, it would come with an asterisk. Say it would have gone on the books as a 400, but they would have had to said, this is 399.5, round it up. <laughs> and uh, he wanted to be legit.
I like Bob Feller's comments, you know, the pitcher never lived who could throw the ball by him. He must have had incredible reflexes because those balls are going 100. I think the fastest now is about 101, yeah. something, something like that. Well, uh, Williams always said that, that uh, hitting a, a baseball is the hardest thing to do in sports. And he would get some argument um, from that, like, you know, he and Sam Sneed, the golfer, would, would uh, get into arguments about that. And Sneed would, would try to argue, well, hitting a golf ball is harder. And Williams would say, are you kidding me? The ball is just stationary, and you just can go up and whack it. And, and uh, Sneed said, yeah, all right, Ted, let's see you do it. And Williams' you know, drive would slice off into the woods. And, <laughs> and uh, I think people uh, generally, I mean, uh, I think there's a lot of support for Williams' case that, uh, you know, if you stand in the batter's box, against somebody throwing cheese at 98 point miles at 98 miles an hour uh, the idea of getting around even you know uh, turning on that fastball and uh, uh, having a bat speed quick enough that you can it's very difficult to do yeah plus the fact you've always got to watch out that it's not coming straight at your head yeah it happens yeah 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 a golf ball is hard to hit, but it doesn't move. <laughs> it doesn't move. That was Ted's argument. My favorite player is Pedro Martinez because he was the most exciting pitcher I've ever seen, and you never expected him to lose. My favorite pitcher is probably Kurt Schilling just because he won us our first championship here, and he did it with an injury that by all means he never should have been pitching on. So uh, I'll always have a soft spot for him. Best pitcher that I ever saw pitch, however, was Sandy Koufax. I uh, didn't get to see him that often, but Sandy Koufax, I mean, I think he had like six no-hitters in six years. I mean, who, who does that? I mean, the guy, was, the guy was amazing. Over 25 years ago, we said legal education was broken. Change is uncomfortable, but it's often needed. So we rolled up our sleeves and we fixed it. Schools are just too expensive. Ours isn't. Most schools don't teach needed professional skills. Ours does because our professors continue to have real-world experience. Too often, you settle for a career that's less than what you hoped for. You shouldn't. Come see the future. The Massachusetts School of Law at Andover. Your future starts here. The best batter of all time would have to be Babe Ruth. Favorite all-time player would be Derek Jeter from the New York Yankees. All the 90s Red Sox references, but favorite pitcher to watch as a kid also was Pedro Martinez. Um, this guy was not afraid to throw up and in. He wasn't afraid to let bigger hitters know that this is his plate. And uh, I think he brought an intensity uh, to the mound that was really only rivaled by his disgusting changeup. Stuck in a cubicle, Jess was going nowhere. Carol made the switch from a tech company. Everald was an undergrad who knew he wanted more. He deserved more. Find your future at the Massachusetts School of Law. Immerse yourself in a fun, supportive campus environment. Learn professional skills from instructors with real-world experience. Take the first step in changing your life at the most affordable law school in New England, the Massachusetts School of Law at Andover. Your future starts here. The best batter I ever saw was Ted Williams. Uh, if Ted Williams could hit, I mean, he was... Nobody hit like nobody could hit like the splendid splinter. He had the most beautiful swing that I've ever seen. His book is still a classic. I mean, I think if you want to learn to be a great hitter, you have to read his book. And he could hit with power, and he could hit for average. Of course, he was the last one to ever hit over 400, and I don't think that'll be broken. At least <laughs> I, I can't see that ever being broken again. And one thing about Ted is that it's important to know he didn't want to be just good he wanted to look good and uh, you know he had that he probably had the most beautiful swing ever in in baseball the an, a slight uppercut and uh, he wanted to get the ball up in the air go for where, power where did he learn to swing like that did somebody teach him did he figure it out no it, it was you know just work on the playground and that that was the natural swing that he developed and, uh, you know, he would go to school each day carrying a bat. He would swing the bat on the way to school. He'd pass these storefronts and admire his uh, reflection in the looking <laughs> glass. 
and he'd stop and take a swing and the guy selling the bakery or somebody would say, what the hell is this kid doing? Uh, you know, this, this vain young boy. What, a, what about uh, uh, black and Mexican players? I mean, he, he was pretty decent about that what at, at the time when Major League Baseball was the opposite. Yeah, one of the great things that he did, he had, he had come up with black players in, uh, in high school and the, and the minor leagues. He had played against Jackie Robinson in Southern California. And uh, his high school, Ted's, was, was all white, but he had played other, against other players. And in the minor leagues, he'd gone up against uh, some of the old Negro League uh, barnstorming teams, Satchel Paige and others. One of his uh, most notable moments came in 1966 after he was retired and he, when he was being inducted into the Hall of Fame. And he went off script. You know, you thank everybody who put you there that day, but then he called on uh, the, the powers that be in the Hall of Fame to um, admit the Negro League players some of the great black ball players who were then banned from becoming in the, into the Hall of Fame because they had never played in the major leagues, which of course it was a catch-22. Jackie Robinson didn't break the color line until 47. That was a courageous thing to do, and Williams earned enormous goodwill uh, with the black players for uh, doing that. And I think it had something to do with his being uh, Mexican in part, Mexican-American, and knowing the sting of prejudice. And um, so when Robinson integrated the league, uh, Williams sent him a letter of congratulations when Larry Doby became the first black player in the American League for the Cleveland Indians the following year. Uh, Williams would go out of his way to welcome him and chat him up and how you doing and um, that kind of thing. I think that that, that, that was a uh, a significant thing that he did to, to feel, to make black players uh, feel welcome. You know, if, if memory serves me right, I think a guy named Fleetwood Walker in the 1880s was a, was a black ball player and was the, maybe the first black ball player in the major leagues. So they had what in effect were major leagues in those days. And then somehow, I, I think it was Cap Anson of the Chicago Cubs that said no more of this. He's a bigot. And then there were no, as you point out, there were no blacks for about 60 years in the major leagues. Ast absolutely astounding. And everybody knew that they were wonderful ball players. In fact, they used to, uh, when the Cubs weren't at home at Wrigley Field and the same goes in other stadia, the uh, African American leagues would play. Yes, them. yes. And th that was a way that the um, major league owners made money. That revenue stream was one reason that um, they didn't want integrated baseball because really? they were making money um, yeah. off segregation. And they also worried that um, if black players uh, played in the majors, that the, the white fan base would be offended and stop coming to the games. Who knows, you know, and they could have they could have been accurate, not justifiable, but it might have been accurate. Right. Of course, you know, those were just terrible days. Everybody passed on Robinson, on Willie Mays. That's just startling. Red Sox did. Red Sox passed on Willie Mays. A lot of, I think a lot of teams passed on Willie Mays. Passed on, on, on Robinson and Mays. Yes, uh, yes. So can you imagine a, uh, an outfield of... of uh, Dom DiMaggio, uh, Willie Mays. And Ted. And Ted Williams. Yeah. <laughs> yep. But that's all I can do is imagine it. Yeah, right. <laughs> the Red Sox were not good uh, when it came to uh, uh, black athletes. Yeah, well... I don't think that was Ted's fault. That was Tom Yawkey's fault, yeah. the owner. So you said people blame him. I don't think generally, at least the knowledgeable fans, blame him, knowing that he, that he helped black players. But it is an interesting question. Given Ted's role as a star for the Red Sox, could he have pushed Yawkey privately more to um, integrate faster? He told a few friends late in life, Williams, that yes, he, he thought he should have done more. When you dry the moisture out of bats, the ball would be hit farther and harder. Did he figure that out? This guy, Larry Pressman, um, um, 
offered that theory to him, and he was interested. It's, it's one of the, uh, the, the new stories in the book. It's a local fellow, older man now, uh, who lived in um, Chelsea, across the uh, Mystic River from Boston, had grown up a fan of Williams, and he, he had sort of a scientific bent, and he was experimenting with the effect of moisture on bats. He noticed if he left his bat out overnight, it would, it would um, be heavier after absorbing moisture from the dew and the grass and so forth. And uh, he experimented one day and heated the bat in his uh, wood stove. Noticed that uh, the next day that the bat was lighter and uh, he could hit better with it. And so he, he writes a letter to Ted Williams and the letter finds its way to Ted and Ted is intrigued. He's a 14-year-old kid or something at the time. Ted says, come on in to the Fenway Park and uh, let's talk. The pressman goes in and uh, they talk about this. And William says, well, um, you have a, a wood stove to heat your bats. Uh, how am I going to do that? And Pressman says, well, you've got, a, you've got an industrial strength uh, washer dryer here in the clubhouse. You, you wrap the bats in a towel and you put it in the dryer, let it go for about 15, 20 minutes, and then the, the bat will be uh, nice and dry. And uh, Ted tried this and then went out and took some batting practice and found that, that uh, he was getting better performance out of this. The um, pressman, he wanted more proof of this and so they, they had a batting practice session uh, arranged with, you know, bats that had moisture and bats that didn't. And Ted took a scientific approach to this and concluded that he was getting better performance. So he did this, uh, unknown to, uh, I'm really revealing it in the book, uh, to most everybody, but I got several players like Jimmy Pearsall and Bobby Dore to confirm that, yes, he would do this in, uh, in the clubhouse, heat the bats. And the other player, players thought it was just another Williams eccentricity. <laughs> and uh, he did it. Yeah. yeah. Famous he quote. He made a great catch and broke his elbow crashing into a wall. What, you know, did he ever say what possessed him to do that? Yeah, good, good, good question. The heat of the moment, I guess. That, that was the 1951 All-Star game where he broke his elbow making a, uh, a really good catch. And you're right, it, it, that didn't square with his famous quote, they don't pay off on fielding, yeah. which is really true when you think about it. You, even today, you read a, a story about a, a baseball player, it's all about his hitting and what his average is and uh, this and that, uh, not, not so much about uh, his fielding. Uh, but that was a day when he did make a, uh, a rare sparkling catch, and uh, he always said that he wasn't the same after that, that he didn't get the arm extension that you well, really What did he think not getting the arm extension meant in terms of his hitting? Meant that, it, that he wasn't getting the follow through and the power, the power that he had beforehand. Yeah. Why don't you talk about uh, a comparison between Joe DiMaggio and, and he uh, in terms of what each did and what each accomplished? Yeah. Well, they were the great stars of the day in, in baseball's uh, heyday. Um, well, you know, there was one guy in the, in the National League, too, Musial. Yes. Who probably ranked with them. But, you know, you'd hear about DiMaggio and Williams because there was the American League. And, and uh, Musial played at St. Louis, which was, you know, um, way out in the Midwest somewhere. And, and, uh, yeah, there's an old Yiddish word, Yenemveld. It was in <laughs> Yenemveld. Way the hell out there somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> and... And Musial didn't have the uh, dynamic personality that yeah. uh, uh, Joe and Ted did, especially Ted. DiMaggio was actually quite quiet and sullen, but um, they had a great rivalry, Ted and Joe. For um, DiMaggio, the rivalry was uh, personal. For Ted, it was uh, friendly. And, uh, but DiMaggio extended the rivalry even into retirement. He would always privately disparage Williams to his friends. He'd say, tell him to hold up his hand. How many rings does he have? 
meaning World Series championships. And of course, Ted had none. The Red Sox had only won the uh, World Series once in Williams's career, 1946, when they lost to the Cardinals in seven games, and DiMaggio won, you know, uh, what, 10 or 11 World Series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, beat the Dodgers every time. Yeah. And he'd say that he, you know, uh, that he runs like a duck, you know, talking about Williams, and he throws like a broad, and you know, he's, uh, he's uh, you know, unkind remarks. Yeah. And but whereas Ted was always more generous uh, to Joe uh, in his private remarks, and uh, always said he's a great player. Uh, always conceded that he was a better all-around player, certainly. Ted was a one-dimensional player. Yeah. All he cared about was hitting. Yeah. He had this, this uh, lifelong rivalry, but I, I think uh, Ted was uh, kinder to Joe. I found it uh, remarkable that when attendance went down in, what, 1942, DiMaggio and Williams both felt, uh, Joe DiMaggio and Williams both felt that the ball had been dead and the owners agree, got together and agreed to tell the managers, pitch to Williams so he'll hit more. <laughs> yeah. That's astounding. I can't imagine that happening today. See, Williams, Don DiMaggio, Bobby George, uh, Johnny Pesky, Vern Stevens, Ellis Kinder, uh, th those are all mentioned in your book, and uh, I would add Bernie Tevitz and Walt Ropo. Yeah. How did that team ever lose a game? Hmm. I mean, that was an all-time team. That was the 51 team? Yeah, and yeah. They, they had been that way since about 46. Yeah. Well, then the team broke up. Um, Door retired, and you know, they didn't have the depth of pitching, ah. you know. I mean, after Ellis Kinder, it got pretty thin. And They uh, had a guy named Jack Kramer who was pretty good for a while. Yeah, yeah. But I guess that was it, Kinder and then maybe yeah. Kramer. And then when you head into the 50s, uh, the rest of that decade, um, the team was really pretty lousy, and, and Ted was the, the the only reason to come to Fenway Park, really. There is a story uh, that you wanted to tell about Williams, because apparently it's one of many remarkable ones about him. Why don't you go ahead and, and uh, tell it? Well, there are a million uh, great Ted Williams stories, and um, sometimes they're uh, difficult to uh, recount publicly because Ted was so profane that they're not always uh, fit to be uh, heard in an audience <laughs> like this. But one of my favorite stories happened in 1955 when the Red Sox were playing the Washington Senators at Fenway Park in uh, summer of 55. And the, the uh, pitching for the Senators uh, that day was a rookie named Pedro Ramos, Cuban. Remember him? Oh, sure. Williams came up, and uh, Ramos struck Ted out. And it was very unusual for Ted to strike out. So Ramos, this rookie, was beside himself with excitement at having struck out the great Williams. So after the game, in an act of great uh, chutzpah, this rookie takes the ball that he struck out Williams with, barges into the Red Sox clubhouse, approaches the great man, and asks him would he autograph the ball that Ramos struck him out with. And Ted said, get the blankety blank out of here with that ball, I'm never gonna sign it. But somebody persuaded Ted ultimately to sign the ball for this young Cuban rookie, Pedro Ramos. Ramos takes the ball back, you know, happy man. Fast forward uh, two or three weeks later, the Senators are back in town at Fenway, and Ramos is on the mound again. Up comes Ted, puts the first pitch 20 rows up in the bleachers for a home run. <laughs> and he's into his home run trot. He's rounding third. He yells over to Ramos, I'll sign that son of a bitch, too, if you can find it. <laughs> I think that's my favorite Ted story. Yeah. I want to thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, buy this book and read it. It is truly interesting. And while it's about a great sports hero, it's about a lot more than, uh, just, quote, just a sports hero. And be with us again next time. Thank you. Mm -hmm.